Okay. All righty. So as I said, it's going, to be a, it's going to be a very practical sermon that you're going to be able to use. You're going to be able to make application in your life. And, you know, we have all different types of relationships. You know, we have the relationship with our wife, men. And obviously women, you know, the counterpart, they would have the relationship with their husband. We have relationships with, you know, a family. Sometimes it's immediate family or it can be extended family. We have relationships with our boss at work. You know, we have relationships with our neighbor. We have relationships. Sometimes you, you uh, will bump into people, maybe old friends. There are all different types of situations where we have to interact and engage with different people on different levels, and it's not the same dynamic. So I'm going to be going over how to resolve conflicts in a very general way, but I'm going to give you uh, guidelines, you know, different principles that we can use as Christians to be able to live a peaceable life life, to be peaceful people. So here in Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 9, of course this is the, the Beatitudes. This is one of the most famous uh, passages or part of Scripture in the entire Bible. And uh, there are a lot of great virtues that are taught here. But we're told in verse number 9, the Bible says once more, Blessed are the peacemakers. And it tells you this, For they shall be called the children of God. So you can see how important that it is to be a peacemaker. If you are a peacemaker, you will be called, the Bible says, a child of God. You will be the children of God. I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter number 14, verse number 19. I want to talk about first, you know, just the virtue of bringing about peace or being a peaceable person, living a peaceful life, and how important it is to have peace in our lives. Romans chapter number 14, verse number 19. Not only that, it's important that we seek peace. We should be people that desire peace. We shouldn't be someone that just thrives on drama. And then we just always want drama in our life. We, like, we enjoy conflict or we enjoy controversy where we're just looking for a problem you know, to spring about so we can get involved in it. Or maybe we're the type of person that causes these conflicts. That should not be the type of person that we are. Christians are commanded to be peaceable people, and we should be seeking and desiring peace in our lives. Look at Romans chapter 14, verse number 19. The Bible says this, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. So notice that we should be following after the things which, which make for peace. And notice what it's coupled with there. It's coupled with edifying one another. So peace has to do with edifying or building someone up. It has to do with helping another person. It's a selfless act. Peace and edifying are put together. I want you to go now to, we're going to look at a few scriptures. Go to the Old Testament with me. Psalm chapter number 34, verse number 14. Psalm chapter number 34, verse number 14. <clears throat> I'm going to read to you from 1 Peter chapter number 3. Verse number 11, the Bible says this, Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. So if you would have noticed there, the verse I read, 1 Peter 3, peace and good are used interchangeable. So you can see that the word peace is very closely related to that which is good. It says, let him eschew evil, right? That means to stay away from evil, to keep it away from us. To eschew it like you do to a dog. Shoe, right? Let him eschew evil. And then it says, and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Psalm chapter number 34, verse 14, where you're at, you'll see this sounds very similar. Depart from evil and do good. So again, eschew evil and do good. I believe 1 Peter 3 is quoting from here. Then it says this, seek peace and pursue it. So, notice again that peace is being used interchangeable with good. Number one, just to be very simplistic, peace is good. Peace is a good thing. To have peace or to possess peace, it's good. But not only that, furthermore, the opposite of peace is evil. It's, although the word evil oftentimes in the Bible, yes, it can be referring to transgression or sin, but I'll tell you what else it's referring to, harm which is also the opposite of peace. So there, you know, that's, that would be a synonym for uh, evil would be harm, which is the, an antonym for peace. Peace is a good thing. Go to Psalm chapter number 122 while you're in the book of Psalms there. Psalm chapter number 122 on the subject of seeking peace. We should desire peace. We should want peace in our lives. 
It should be something that, as we've seen twice, that we are seeking, we are ensuing it. The, the Bible used in Psalm 34 the word pursue. You as a Christian should be pursuing peace in your life. You should be looking for peace in your life. You shouldn't be looking for problems. You shouldn't be looking co for controversy or looking for drama. There are a lot of people like this. It may sound ridiculous, but there are people that look for drama and they thrive off of it. And if there's not drama going on in their life, they're unhappy. Or if there's not drama going on in their life, they're going to make sure that they start some. That they are the, the troublemaker, right? We should be seeking peace. We should be looking for peace. Psalm 122 verse 6 says this, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Now this, of course, people will try to misapply this about you know, the modern state or the modern you know, country of Jerusalem. This is talking about those that, that love God. You notice that? It said, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, they shall prosper that love thee. So this does not apply to the modern state of Jerusalem. They do not love the Lord Jesus Christ. They hate Him. Look at verse 7. Peace be within thy walls, and prosperity within thy palaces. So first it says pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It's saying pray for, for the peace of those that love God. Christians. We should desire peace for ourselves, but furthermore... We should also desire peace for other Christians. We should desire peace for those that love God. For, keep reading there, verse number 8 in Psalm 122. It says, For my brethren, so notice, the Christian, For my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say, Peace be within thee. Talking about the, the walls of Jerusalem. He desires that those that love God have peace. Because of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek peace. Thy good. So notice again that peace is a good thing. Over and over and over again we see in the Bible that the word peace is coupled with or even used synonymous with the word good. We should be looking for peace in our life. We should be seeking after peace. Peace is a good thing. I want you to go to Proverbs chapter number 12 verse number 20. Proverbs chapter number 12 verse number 20. I'm going to real quick you know, uh, uh, let another nugget of truth sink down into your minds. This is just going to be a sub point to what we're talking about right now. Kind of go over it real quick. The reason why you should seek peace is because if you have peace you will have joy. If you don't have peace you're not going to have joy. If you don't have a, if you're not living a peaceful life what that means is you're not living a joyful life. Peace and joy are coupled together, one with another, just as peace is, is the same thing as good. It is goodness. Look at Proverbs chapter number 12, verse number 20. It says this, Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil, but to the counselors of peace is joy. Notice that peace, number one, and joy are contrasted with evil. It's the opposite of evil, harm. Also, you know, uh, sin, in this case, it definitely has the connotation of that which is sin or, or uh, uh, transgression against the Lord. But it says this, but to the counselors of peace, so a person that, that counsels of peace, it says that it, that it is joy. Uh, Isaiah chapter number 55, verse number 12 says this, For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Notice that the man that has peace has also what? Joy. He's a joyful man. A peaceful man is a joyful man. It's someone that is happy. If you have peace, you know what that means? It means you're happy. Look at, or actually I'll just read to you Isaiah chapter number 54 verse number 13. You don't have to turn there. It says this, And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. So notice that it says there, And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. How are they taught of the Lord? Of course, we take the Word of God, this is the Word of God, this is His counsel, and then we exposit it to our children. We sit down and take time out of our days and we teach it from the Word of God. So it is, it is by proxy the Lord teaching our children. And what is the result of that? Our children being taught in the counsels of the Lord growing up and then putting that into practice. The, the result of that, consequently it says, and great shall be the peace of thy children. I'm sure everyone here desires for their children to grow up and to live a peaceful life. Everyone here wants their child to grow up and live in peace, right? You know how to do that? You teach your children the law of the Lord. You know what's going to happen if you don't teach your child the law of the Lord? They're going to have a very unpeaceful life. They're going to have a life that has no joy. They're going to have a life that is miserable, 
A, a miserable person is a person that has no peace. You know, the Bible, you know, the Bible teaches that there is no peace to the wicked. You know, the person that lives a sinful life that keeps away from the counsel of the Lord, that person is going to have the exact opposite life of a peaceful life. But if we teach our children the law of the Lord, if we teach our children the counsels of God and the mind of the Lord, the result of that will be a peaceful life. So how do we live a peaceful life? We need to read the Bible and put these things into practice. We need to not live a sinful, wicked life. That's how you have peace. I want you to turn now to Psalm chapter number 120, verse number 7. So point number one there was desire peace. As a Christian, you should be seeking and desiring peace. It's something that you should be ensuing, the Bible says. You should be trying to have peace in your life and looking for peace. <clears throat> point number two is going to be this. Our disposition inherently, how we are naturally, what, you know, what our natural characteristics or attitude is. That's what a disposition is. Our disposition should be that of peace. We should be a peaceful person in our attitude, in the way we live our lives, the way that we engage with others. We should be a person that brings about peace. There are some people that are just troublemakers. There are some people that you know that they're just the common factor, right? You, you, know, you know this person and they have an issue with everyone. They're the exact opposite of being a peaceful person. They don't have peace. They don't enjoy peace in their life and they're the problem. We need to have a disposition of that of peace. There are other people that are able to get along with everybody. There are other people that are just peaceful people, right? Now there are exceptions to this. Of course there are times, you know, the Bible says that there is a time for peace and a time for war. Of course there are exceptions, but that's why you say our disposition. This is our natural attitude that we have. This is how we are inherently. This is how we are just naturally. That you should be a peaceful person in general. You should have peace. You should seek peace. You should be a person that is easy to get along with and a person that brings about peace. As I said, there are some people that, that bring about trouble. And you know when this person's around, there's going to be an argument. You know when this person's around, they're going to be disagreeable. They're going to be contrary. They're just going to be in opposition to everything that you have. They're just a, 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 just a quarreling type of person, aren't they? Just a kind of fighting type of person. It, it's like, and sometimes people may be oblivious to this, right? There may be people that are just oblivious to the fact that, you know, that they're the exact opposite of a peaceful person. They're, they're fighting with people all the time. We as Christians, we need to be conscientious of this. We need to look at our lives and we need to be aware of, of our personality, our attitude. And number one, we need to desire peace and seek peace. But number two, our disposition should be that of peace. Point number two. Look at Psalm chapter number 120. Psalm chapter number 120. Psalm chapter number 120, it's going to be verse number 7. Psalm chapter number 120, verse number 7. The Bible says this, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Now I want you to notice what his disposition is. What is he inherently? What is his attitude? How is he in his life? If you could describe David's personality, what is he? He's a peaceful person, exactly. He's for peace. He propagates peace. He wants to get along with people. He doesn't want to live a life where he's fighting, arguing, and for trouble, right? He wants to be per for peace. Now, is there a time for war? Yes. You know, should we defend ourselves? Should we stand up for what is right? Yes. But in our lives, our disposition should be th that we are for peace. We should be for peace. I want you to go with me now to... Uh, Go ahead and turn to Romans chapter number 14, verse number 14. Romans chapter number 14, verse number 14. So, two quick points already. Number one, again, we should desire peace. As a Christian, that is a quality that you should be seeking after. You should be examining your life. You shouldn't be just going through your life and being satisfied with how you are and not being conscious of how you, know, how you are behaving daily. You should be looking at yourself. We're all, all of us have sin. No one is perfect. No one has met you know, no one will ever meet the expectations that the Lord has for them. So you should be all the time examining yourself and saying, do I have this quality? You're reading the Bible when you're hearing preaching. Do I have this quality that I'm hearing of or that I'm reading of? And look at yourself, look at the areas of your life and say, hey, am I lacking in this area? And we're all lacking in some way in every area. We need to apply these things to our lives. We need to be continually growing. So we need to look at the Bible 
reflect it upon ourselves and say, you know, where can I, I improve in these areas? So number one, we should desire peace. You should daily be going about your life trying to seek after peace and bettering yourself in your Christianity by doing so. Desiring peace. We shouldn't be desiring drama. Of course, you know, there are times when there needs to be war, right? There needs to be, you know, arguing and, and things like that. Contention, right? We shouldn't be a contentious person. We should be a peaceful person. But is there a time to contend? Yes, we should contend for the faith. Are there doors where we go to a door, sometimes in soul winning, where we need to contend with someone all the time, right? I mean, it's common. You know, you go out soul winning for maybe an hour or two hours. You know, you're going to have probably at least one door where there is contention. But you should be, it shouldn't be every door. It shouldn't be every single person that you speak with. You should be a peaceful person. And then there should be, you know, there are times where there's war, where there's contention. Number two, again, our disposition should be that of peace. Point number three, really quick. Uh, and there's going to be sub points under this. We need to be the type of person that makes peace or recreates peace in a hostile environment. We should be a peacemaker. And what does that imply when you are a peacemaker? It implies that there isn't peace. It implies that there's trouble, there's fighting, there is you know, a quarrel going on, there's conflict. We as Christians should be able to resolve conflicts. This is a skill. You either have the skill of resolving conflict or you do not. Some people are not able to resolve conflicts. Some people don't know how to resolve a conflict and they're not good at you know, uh, dis extinguishing a fight or extinguishing an argument or you know, bringing about peace. Now, are there times, again, I want to make sure that I give these, these exceptions uh, you know, uh, the, the attention that they deserve. Are there times when, we, when there should be war and there shouldn't be peace? Of course. There are times when there's an argument. If we had an issue in our church and it was a, an issue that the Bible says you know, needs to be addressed, and I'm going to get to this and more so at the end, you know, uh, having these types of issues with family, friends, just all the different relationships and addressing all of these. Are there types of issues where it needs to be addressed? Yes. But most of the time, the, the, the things that, that cause us not to have peace, the fightings, the quarrels, all of that, most of the time, it's petty in your life. Most of the time, it's things that, that could be squashed and put to the side and could be ignored and avoided. And it's not worth not having peace. Right. Peace should take priority. That's what I want you to understand from the introduction of this sermon. Peace is important. You should be looking for peace. That should take priority. That should be your disposition. And the exception is the fighting that, you know, the warring that needs to take place. That's the exception in your life. That's not common. Are there issues that occur in a church that need to be dealt with? Yes. Are there issues that occur in, you know, uh, um, you know, maybe with your neighbor or at work that maybe you need to go to your neighbor or go to the, the, your, your co-employee, right? Your, the other person you're working with and, and, and actually speak to them about something. Yeah, there's times where you do. But you know and I know that most of the time when you have issues or a conflict in your life, they're petty, aren't they? Almost every time. They're petty. And, they're, and you know what you should do? You should ignore it, avoid it, and seek peace. That, that's what you should do. So point three, there's going to be sub points under this. I'm going to be going uh, through these next points and they're going to be represented alphabetically. The first three points are number one, number two, number three. I want these to stick in your mind, so I'm going to repeat them again. Number one, desire peace. Christians should desire peace. Number two, our dis disposition should be that of peace. Inherently, we should be a peaceful person, how we carry ourselves, our attitude. So inwardly in our heart, desire peace. Also, the way we live our lives, it sh we should be peaceful. We should be a person that brings about peace when we are around. And number three, this is going to be the remaining part of the sermon. It's going to be the practical por portion. Resolve conflict. We as Christians should be able to resolve the conflict after it has already begun. When there is an issue, when there is a conflict or a problem or trouble, a quarrel, whatever you want to refer to it as, you should have the skills to be able to resolve that. Now, point A, which is the first sub-point under point three, is this. The, the main problem why conflict continues and is not resolved is because of 
pride. That's the main reason why conflict will continue on and people will continue fighting and they'll never come to a time of peace. And the reason is because people are not able to forgive one another. Another One person is not able to give forgiveness to another person because of maybe the wrong that they did. And as I mentioned, most of the time, problems that occur in your life, if you look around and you think of conflicts that you have, most of the time they're petty. Most of the time they're things that are meaningless. And if you were to tell another person that's not in your shoes, they'd say that's stupid. That's ridiculous. That's not worth it. And most of what's going on in, in these situations is the majority of people that are involved in these conflicts, the reason why it continues is because of pride, because they're not willing to forgive. So, <clears throat> number one, what we need to do if we're involved in this conflict, number one, we need to find out if we are the person that uh, committed the transgression, if we're the one that sinned against this other person, right? If we did something to the other person, if you are, if you are, you know, uh, uh, guilty of anything at all, you should need to apologize to the person, right? Like the Bible tells us in Luke uh, 17, I believe, the way in which to, if it is a serious transgression, to uh, regain that relationship is for you to repent and ask for forgiveness. That's what you need to do. You need to, if you are guilty of anything at all. Because what are we seeking? Peace. That should be your priority. You should do what you need to do to bring about peace. You need to be a peacemaker. I'm giving you tips on how to create peace in your life. And it's a skill. And a lot of times because of pride. And it's going to be the guiding principle. Humility versus pride in conflict. Humility versus pride. The, the humble man is the one that tries to bring about peace. The prideful man is the man that's just hanging on to, to you know, whatever has been done wrong to him or whatever the person said to him and he's not able to forgive the other and then they'll just continue in this battle. So you need to be humble, you need to put away your pride and you need to maybe examine the situation and hey you might not have even done the biggest, the biggest transgression, right? Uh, if it's not something that's, you know, that's big enough in the Bible to that the person needs to you know, uh, uh, really forgive you over, if it's not something that's, you know, that you don't feel, if you step back and be rational and reasonable, look at it and see how big of a problem it is. Is it something that they honestly need to ask for forgiveness for? If not, you need to go to them and say, hey, let's just let this go. Right? So that takes a humble person. That takes a person with humility. The prideful man is the one who just wants to keep fighting and keep arguing with him. So we need to have humility. That's going to be the guiding principle throughout these points. So I want you to look with me at Romans 14. We read from here earlier, Romans chapter number 14. And we learn a lot about how to have peace with conflict, with controversy in Romans chapter number 14. <clears throat> And we're actually in this chapter recently. We read verse 19 just a moment ago, just to show you again that this speaks of peace. Two different times it speaks of peace. I'll show you verse 19 again first. Look at verse 19 in Romans 14. It says this, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. The word edify means to build up, to help another person. So we need to follow after the things that make for peace. Now if we back up, peace is also mentioned in verse number 17. Look at verse number 16. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. So notice good and evil being mentioned there, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So notice that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. And then it says, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Notice peace and joy are also coupled together. They're right, because if you have peace, you know what you have? Joy. If you have joy, you know what you have? You have peace. They come together. You can't have one without another. It's a package deal. If you have peace, you're going to have joy. The kingdom of God, speaking of the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus said, you know, behold, the kingdom is, is in. They're asking, you know, when is the kingdom of God going to appear? And he says, the kingdom of God is within you. This is talking about the Holy Spirit when it talks about the kingdom of God. That you're going to have peace and joy. That is the, that, when you look at the fruits of the Spirit, that's what it's referring to. Peace, joy, these things are mentioned as well. That's why it says, in the Holy Ghost. That's why it's very plainly spoken of right there. So you have peace, you're going to have joy. And righteousness is also there because what? It's good. It's the opposite of evil. Now why does it say in verse number 17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it contrasts that. 
It says righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. What is the context of Romans 14? We're not going to go through all of this because we mentioned it recently. The, the, the context of Romans 14 is that verse number 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. I talked about this uh, last Sunday morning on the subject of veganism, right? And what it's talking about is how to get along with another brother in Christ. And it's talking about you know, these little doubtful disputations. And it, and it gives you a couple of different examples of these doubtful disputations. And it talks about the meat and the drink being a stumbling block to your brother. Now with that in mind, I want you to look back at verse number 13. Look at, look, go back up and look at verse 13. It says this, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now what's the most important thing here? Making sure that we're not causing a brother to stumble. You notice that? He's saying this is what we need to be worried about. Look at verse 14 further. It says the same thing. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth it, esteemeth anything to be clean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Now in this situation, it's a, it's a new Christian. It's someone who's bothered by it. feels like it's a sin. And if it's not of faith, it's a sin. If you feel like it's wrong and you, you violate your conscience and you go ahead and break that, then you've sinned against the Lord. The Bible's very clear. That's why it's saying if it's not of faith, it is sin. So if you're doing something not of faith and you think it's wrong and you commit that act, the Bible teaches that's a sin. And in this situation, what Paul is saying is that it would be better. It would be better for you to just suffer loss. It would be better for you to abstain from the meat and the drink when you're in the presence of your brother. He's saying that if it bothers your brother, the meat and the drink, flesh, let's say, and whatever drink it may be, you know, whatever it is that bothers him to see you consume, when you are with him, when you are around him, for his sake, what should you do? Not eat of it and not drink of it. I'm not saying, of course, alter your entire lifestyle. It's saying when you're around this man. It's saying when you're with this person. You know, if, if he sees you doing it, right? We should, we should have priority where? What is it teaching? The priority should be with having peace. Is the meat and the drink more important or is the peace more important? That's the whole point is that you should be willing for your brother. If something bothers him, if something is going to cause an issue for him or cause you know, a controversy for him, in this case it's going to be a stumbling block possibly for him and maybe cause him to fall into sin and cause him to go off the wrong track. Right? The Bible says that you should rather suffer loss. So you know, in this passage what you can really see is the importance of bringing about peace. You can see the importance of having peace because the Bible's teaching, hey, you know, and that's why Paul explains, there's nothing unclean of itself. I can eat meat. I can drink drink. There's nothing wrong with that. I know that it's not a sin, but if it's going to cause a problem for my brother, if it's going to cause an issue between him and me, I would rather not eat meat. I would rather not drink this drink so that I can retain this relationship. What's the reason? Because the, the priority is having peace. So from this passage, number one, we can see the importance of peace. That you should be willing to sacrifice certain things. And of course we can see that meat and drink is not important. That's why he contrasts the two in verse number 17. He says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. What's he saying? That's not important. What is important? The kingdom of God. You know, that's all temporal. That's all temporary. And then he says this but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You know what is important? Having peace. You know what is important? Having joy. The church being in peace. The church having joy. He goes on further. That's why he says, verse 19, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. What is that? This is teaching you how to be a peacemaker. Follow after the things which make for peace. And then he goes on and says, And things wherewith one may edify another. So what are the things that make for peace in this particular passage? It would be suffering loss. This is point number B of how to. Number one, not to be a prideful person. Have humility, right? 
And these two things, as I said, that's the guiding principle. You're not going to do the next two points if you're a proudful, per, prideful person or if you're not a humble person. You're not going to do the next two points because this point is being able to suffer loss. Being able for you to lose something. And you know, uh, that's the last thing that a proud person wants to do is to abstain from something or to stop doing something for someone else's sake. Because a proud person is, is, a, is always a selfish person. It's a person that is uh, you know, interested in themselves and making sure that they get the things that, that they want to have, right? To have peace, we need to be a person that is willing to suffer loss for another person. Amen. We need to be a person that is willing to sacrifice something for another person. In this case, he gives you an example. And keep this in mind. This is hypothetical. He's not talking about a real situation where a real person... I'm not saying it didn't happen and maybe he used another example. But in, in Romans 14, he speaks as if it's hypothetical. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful dis disputations. You know, and then he says, for one believeth. He's just dreaming this up. This is theoretical. So what's the point? He also gives you, uh, you know, the, another person esteems one day above another. He's just giving you examples. Do you know what his point is? Peace needs to be the priority among Christians. Peace needs to be what's important. And your own you know, uh, 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 preferences in areas, the things that we like, the things that we you know, uh, uh, enjoy, the pleasure maybe that we have, especially temporal things like that, we should abstain from those. We should be willing to abstain from those for what? Peace. Why do we have priorities in life? What's the purpose that you sit down and you write down, this is priority number one, this is priority number two, this is priority number three? Have you ever thought of that? Exactly. Do you know why is this? When you look at your time, you have to realize what you're going to sacrifice. And if you say, hey, I want to put most of my time in priority number one, what are you saying about the other ones? I'm willing to sacrifice time for number two, number three, number four, and number five. That's what it's about. It's about which ones are you willing to sacrifice time for? Which ones are you going to make sure that priority number one, that's what I'm for sure going to make sure that I do. And do you know what this is here? In this passage, it's talking about what's important and what takes precedence or preeminence. What's at the top? What is superior? Peace. Having peace is what's superior. And you know what else? You should be willing to sacrifice everything else for that. You know what's the most important thing? Peace. So this should embed in your mind the importance of being a peaceful person. And as I said here, you know, this is the only other time that in the Bible, besides Matthew 5, being a peacemaker is mentioned. What are the things which make for peace? Suffering loss. This is the most important point in this entire sermon. How can you be a peacemaker? What is Matthew 5, 9 talking about and what do you have to do to be a peacemaker? Well, right here it's telling you to follow after the things which make for peace. And what is it? Suffering loss. If you are going to make peace with someone, you are going to be the one that has to suffer loss most of the time. You are going to be the one that has to go and say, hey, I'm sorry, even if it's the small little thing that happened in the situation. If you look at most controversies and problems and fights that two friends or two brothers get into, a lot of times neither one of them are big. If there are two transgressions, a lot of times one person does something and because of pride another person responds to that, don't they? Because you know, of course, mankind, we're all, we all have you know, a, a degree of pride in us, right? And the, the inclination when someone does us wrong is to do what? To respond back and to try to hurt them just like they hurt us. Why? Because they hurt your pride is why. Because they, because they hurt your feelings and you want to make sure that you do the same to them. You want to make sure that you don't look bad, that you win, right? You know what you need to do a lot of the times? Step back and look at the situation and I guarantee you that what they did to you and what you did to them is petty. And if it's not worth something where you feel like you need an apology, if it's not necessarily a Luke 17 situation where you can't forgive them unless they repent, just go to them and suffer loss and stop being a baby and say I'm sorry for what little thing you did to them. Because most of the time when they've done you wrong, you did something back. Or maybe they did something wrong to you and you weren't aware. They did something wrong to you because they thought that you had done something to them and you weren't even aware of it. How many times have 
You found out that someone was mad at you about something or angry with you and they've been acting funny and then you find out that it was because of something that never even happened or was in their mind and they thought that you had done something you really didn't do or you were acting in a way that you really weren't acting. And it didn't mean what they thought it meant. So you know what else you can do? Is you can go to that person and say, hey, you know, I want to know what's going on. You know, why are we having these problems? What is the issue? If I've done anything wrong, this is taking the high road. This is you suffering loss. If I've done anything wrong, I didn't mean to and I'm sorry. And you know what? If you did do something wrong and you're willing to just let, you know, to just brush off the one transgression that they did to you, you know what you need to do? You need to suffer loss. You need to be a person that makes peace. You need to be a peacemaker as a Christian. A Christian should be a peacemaker. If you're not a peacemaker, you're not going to be called a child of God. Isn't that pretty important? Being called, having the title of being the children of God, being a child of God. The Bible emphasizes that when we went through Hebrews chapter number 1. The importance of having that title of being the son of God, right? And it talked about hey, how great the angels were and they didn't even have the title of son of God. It is a, 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 uh, you know, an honor to be referred to as a child of God. If you want to be a child of God, you need to be a peacemaker. If you're not a peacemaker, you don't deserve the title of being called a child of God. You say, I don't enjoy, I don't enjoy peace. I'm not a peacemaker. Well, then you don't deserve to be called a child of God. You don't deserve the title of being children of God or being referred to as a child of God. Christians need to be peacemakers. And you know, you have you know, uh, uh, different umbrellas of Christianity. You know, you have you know, the evangelicals. Uh, and and, and I'm, I'm referring to legitimate people that are saved. Oftentimes, evangelicals, you'll find them to be saved amongst other denominations. And you have Baptists. What's the main difference between the two? We're far more conservative. We're far more fundamental, right? They're much more liberal. And what things do they focus on more so because of that? Things like peace, things like love, things like all of the, you know, more positive attributes. Do you know what fundamentalists are known for? Focusing on a lot of the negative things. And the reason why is because <clears throat> people will oftentimes overreact. When the world's going liberal, people will oftentimes overreact to all of the liberalism, all of the other churches, even fundamental Baptists nowadays becoming liberal and soft. and They're just every week standing up and preaching a sermon about joy and peace every single week. And they're not spitting, they're not, you know, screaming when they need to and preaching the hard sermons. And what the, the fundamental Baptists that are the ones that are saying, hey, I'm going to remain a fundamental Baptist. What they're doing is they're trying to, they're trying to balance out for that person. But that's not right. We need to have a biblical balance. We need to stop and, 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 and ignore what all, if they're going liberal, they can go liberal. I'm not going to, I'm not going to become, you know, uh, uh, you know, lopsided in my Christianity because of that. And that's what a lot of fundamental Baptists have done. Because there's so much liberalism out there in these Baptist churches, a lot of fundamental Baptists, those that are trying to remain fundamental, are just every single week preaching a negative sermon. And, and you've never heard them preach a sermon on being a peacemaker. You never hear them preach a sermon on joy or love. And they almost try to look down upon it and they almost try to preach against the positive of the Bible. There's a lot of good positive things. There's a lot of really good positive things in the Bible. Joy, love, peace. These are fruits of the Holy Spirit, my friend. And this is something that we should be desiring. If that sounds weird to you, desiring peace, well then you need to read the Bible more. If the idea of seeking peace or ensuing peace is like, you know, well that doesn't sound right, well then we're not, you're obviously not reading the King James Bible. And a lot of these fundamental Baptists, they go way too far the opposite direction. They think it's, you know, being tough or they think it's being manly. You know, they think it's, it's like feminine if you're, you know, if you're against peace. No, actually, you're undisciplined and you have a lack of self-control and you're a prideful person if you're not able to bring about peace. Right. You're a person that don't have discretion and you're not able to control your tongue oftentimes if you're not a person that, that, that brings about peace in your life. You're a person, you're, you know, the Bible says that, that anger rests in the bosom of a fool. You're probably a fool. You're probably a man that has a lot of anger in you if you just go around and you're bringing, you know, uh, hostility everywhere that you go. 
You know, the Bible has a lot of positive things, and I'm not going to overreact to the liberalism of the world. I'm going to find my balance in the King James Bible, and I'm going to have the positive, and I'm going to have the negative. Amen. I'm going to have the good in the sense of peaceful things, and then if there are things that, hey, harm needs to be caused. You know, I need to call something out. I need to preach a negative sermon. That's going to happen too. And I'm not going to be scared away from preaching the peacemaker sermon because I'm afraid somebody's going to call me a liberal. You know, it, normally when someone has this type of attitude, it's because they've overreacted because of the liberalism. We need to find our balance in the King James Bible. We need to avoid, you know, uh, what the world's doing. They're always going like this, constantly. If you try to you know, base you know, where we should be as far as our balance on, on Christianity today, you'll be in a mess. This is where our balance needs to be found in the King James Bible. We need to have peace, but yeah, there's a time for peace and there's also a time for war. We need to be a person that creates peace. How do you make peace? You need to be willing to suffer loss. You need to be willing, you need to, and what type of person will not do that? A prideful person. A person that doesn't have humility. A humble person is a person that's willing to suffer loss. You know what? To suffer loss is to lose. A person that's willing to lose is a person that is a humble person. Like, hey, I don't mind. I'm, I don't mind walking away and looking to, the, to, to everyone, friends, whoever this is, family, Christian, brothers and sisters in the church. I don't mind in this situation looking like I lost as long as I can bring about peace. That's what Paul's saying. You know, you, you, you need, we need to look at and examine our priorities. You know what's important? Having peace. Having peace. We need to be looking for opportunities to suffer loss. Why? So that we can have peace. Next two points are going to go very quickly. I want you to go to Genesis chapter number 33. As I said, being a peacemaker, being a peacemaker is being a person that has the skills in order to bring about peace. A peacemaker... It, 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 uh, it requires skill. You have to have skills to uh, be a peacemaker. Now we're talking about peacemaking. That's resolving conflict. Being a peacemaker. Not just a peaceful person. Not just your disposition is peaceful. Right now in point three we're on resolving conflict. So there's a problem. You know, and, and in this case, hypothetically, you're involved. You're in this situation. You know what you should do? Try to suffer loss. Even if you did something small, they did something bigger than you, but you're willing to brush it off, suffer loss. Go to them and say, I'm sorry. Go to them and apologize. Like in that case, you say, well, that doesn't sound right. In Romans 14, was that guy right for not eating meat and drink? He was wrong. He was the one that was wrong. But Paul was willing to suffer loss and say, hey, I'm not going to eat meat and drink either because I don't want it to hurt him. So that guy was actually wrong. It wasn't the situation where he transgressed him, but it's the same principle. That guy was wrong and he was willing to act like, hey... When I'm around him, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to cause a stumbling block. I don't want to cause an issue with us. I want there to be peace between us. So we need to be willing to suffer loss. That's going to be the primary point. That's, that is the most important thing when it comes to being a peacemaker. Uh, this is point C. You need to possess discernment. You need to possess discretion. Specifically, discretion in your words. Discretion or discernment when speaking. You need to have control over your tongue and know how to word things. You know, the wording of something is very important. The way you word something, just using the wrong word uh, in the wrong context that kind of has the wrong connotation can, can literally cost you a relationship. If it's a sensitive situation already and you don't have enough discretion to, to choose out your words, you're just not skilled in this area, you could say the wrong thing and it could completely destroy a relationship. Now, would it be petty? Of course it would. But we need to be willing to be the one that's trying to make peace. We need to be uh, uh, looking in our lives uh, for ways to be able to bring about peace. And we need to possess the, the uh, ability of discretion. So, <clears throat> what did I say? Genesis 33? Yeah, Genesis 33 first, and we're going to go to Genesis 31 next. I want to use two examples for these last two points very quickly from Jacob, from the man Jacob, because Jacob had a lot of situations of hostility in his life. Jacob and Esau, problems. Jacob and Laban, problems. He had a lot of problems with his wives as well. But in a lot, all of these situations, Jacob ultimately did what? He made peace. Jacob was a peacemaker. Jacob brought about peace. And you know what Jacob did with Laban many times? 
Jacob suffered loss repeatedly. I want to look quickly at an example of uh, <clears throat> uh, with Jacob here and in Genesis 33 and I want to look with it's not Genesis 33 that is not that is not correct I don't believe yes it is yes it is Genesis 33 verse 10 Genesis 33 verse 10 look with me there this is when uh, Jacob and Esau are meeting one another after you know they've had their conflict where Jacob supplanted uh, Esau for his birthright and <clears throat> we know all what happened with that look at verse 10 it says this and Jacob said nay I pray thee if now I have found grace in thy sight then receive my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God. And thou wast pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. Notice the great humility that Jacob has here. Notice that, and of course Jacob did Esau wrong. He realized that, and Jacob was willing to uh, uh, suffer that loss. Especially if you do wrong, of course you should be willing to, to do something to make that up, right? To pay back. So here he's, he's given him a, a sacrifice for that and he's speaking very humbly. He's, he's uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, almost to the point of flattery, not in a bad way, but he's speaking very flowery to him to express his happiness of seeing Esau again. Look at verse 11. Uh, <clears throat> Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. So notice he's urging him. He wants this, uh, this gift to be received. Uh, sometimes you need to be able to give a gift in order to make uh, 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 peace. What is it? That's a way of sacrificing something. So maybe, you know, purchase a meal for someone. If there's been an unspoken battle between you two. You know, that may be all that you need to bring about peace between you and another person, whoever this may be. And he said, let us take our journey and let us go, and I will go before thee. Verse 13, and he said unto him, my Lord knoweth that the children are tender. This is Jacob responding. <clears throat> and the flocks and herds with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. So notice that Esau wanted to yoke up with Jacob there in verse number 12, didn't he? Let us take our journey and let us go and I will go before thee. Jacob responds that, hey, the, the flock, they're not going to be able to do it. The children aren't going to be able to do it. We'll overdrive them. They wouldn't be able to handle it. Verse 14, let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servants. So you go on before me, ahead of me, not with me, he's saying, not together. And I will lead on softly according as the cattle that goeth before me and the children be able to endure until I come unto my Lord unto Seir. And Esau said, Let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said this, What needeth it? Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way unto Seir. Now what you have to keep in mind is an extremely sensitive situation. An extremely si sensitive situation where they have just met each other. They've just, this is the reunification or the reunion of the two brothers. Where they were on horrible terms previously. And I want you to notice how Esau keeps pressuring him to come with him. He br brings it up I believe two, three times, something like that. And he keeps trying to get him to come with him and to be with him. And Jacob has to respond a couple of times, doesn't he? Like, no, I don't want to do that. No, I'm not going to be able to go. He doesn't word it that way, of course, right? That's ultimately what his answer was. We're not going to do that. We're not going to go with you. We're not going to be with you. Now, I want you to think about this, too, because Jacob never goes and, and lives with Esau. Was, was Esau a godly man just from what we know in the Bible? He wasn't. He wasn't. From what we know, he was not a godly man. Uh, just just cherry-picking. We see the wives that he married. And... Oftentimes when men marry Canaanite wives or, or, or wicked women, what happens? There's a warning that's given to the king, lest they turn away your heart from the Lord. It displeased his mother. Why? Because they were already aware of what was the possibility. Uh, Esau, uh, obviously, uh, is a murderer at heart. He was desiring to kill Jacob. You know, Esau is likened unto being a fornicator. He, he despised his birthright. Now, are there good things about Esau that we can point out as well? Yes. But I believe there's a reason why Jacob told Esau that he wasn't going to go with him. I believe there's a reason why Jacob ended up not living his life with Esau. And I believe that he was aware that Esau was not a godly man. 
that Esau, Esau, I believe, pictures the Christian that is backslidden. And a lot of Hebrews talks about that, about a backslidden Christian, and I believe that makes sense why Esau is brought up in that exact context, where it's talking about a backslidden Christian. I believe that Esau is a perfect picture of a, ba of a backslidden brother, of a backslidden Christian. And I want you to notice that when Esau and Jacob get together, Jacob wants to make peace, doesn't he? He wants there to be peace between them two. But Jacob also realizes that it's not good for him just to live with Esau or to yoke up with Esau or to be with Esau. And Esau kept, keeps offering him things and trying to entice him to come with him and extending this invitation of, hey, let's do this, let's do that. And sometimes you'll be in sensitive situations like this. And your words matter even more. And two times Jacob responds. Number one, he responds with discernment when he's speaking to Esau, when Esau's trying to not take his gift. And it says he urged him and he says, take it, brother. I have enough. So he uses the discernment there, you know, I have enough for me. You know, I don't need it. Right? You have it. You take it. Then there, he gives the answer of, of a, a legitimate answer. He's not lying when he tells him in verse 13 that, hey, you know, I don't want to push the children and the flock too hard because it's possible that they could, you know, we could overdrive them and that they could die. That is legitimate. That is a, the, you know, could be a, a serious possibility. You know what else Jacob didn't want to do is Jacob didn't want to go with Esau. That's why Jacob never ended up going with Esau. And then Esau gives him an alternative. He's like, okay, well, how about this? How about we do it this way? And then Jacob responds. You know, it tells you in verse 15, Esau says to him, and Esau said, let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said, what needeth it? Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. So he tells him, what needeth it? You know, we, why do I need this? Why do I have to do this? Why would we have to do this? You know, he's, what he's doing is he's responding with discretion. He's responding with discernment. You know what he doesn't have to do? This is not a situation where he needs to rip his head off. This is not a situation where he needs to, you know, uh, uh, rebuke his brother and point out all the problems or even explain to him why he doesn't want to be with him or even tell him why he doesn't want to be around him or why he doesn't want to go with him. You know what Jacob wanted to do here? Why did he give the answers that he gave? Because he wanted, even still because he, in this situation where he wasn't going to go and live with Esau, he still wanted to have peace with Esau. So one of the major things we can see is the importance of being a peacemaker, even in a situation where Jacob doesn't want to go with Esau, doesn't want to be with Esau, wants to keep his distance from Esau, but he still wanted to have peace. It's important to have discretion and discernment when... You know, uh, we are being a peacemaker, or in order to be a peacemaker. I want you to go now, the last place we're going to turn to, and we're going to do it quickly. Genesis 31 is addressing the issue. Addressing the issue. Genesis 31, we're going to do this very quickly. <clears throat> now, this is when there's a large enough issue to where things are becoming dysfunctional. You know, there are problems, there are issues, whether it be, in, and, and all of the applications can be, you know, a brother and sister in Christ. You know, uh, it could be a brother to another brother, a sister to another sister in Christ. It could be, you know, you know, uh, actual family, an actual another brother, an uncle, you know, whoever it may be, any sort of, of, of family member. It could be just a person at work. It could just be, you know, uh, maybe a neighbor, just maybe an acquaintance, right? But it's a big enough problem to where it needs to be addressed. It need, this needs to... Uh, um, you know, it comes to a head and it needs to be spoken about. Now, what's the two reasons when you feel like you need to bring it to a head? Number one is if you feel as if the person needs to hear the correction that they need to be, because it should be to benefit the person as well. It should be if the person needs to hear the correction because this is a real problem that keeps occurring if you're engaging with this person, right? And the really, number one should have been this, to have peace, because that's important. And, you know, we'll uh, uh, transpose those two points. And number two is so that they can benefit from it, to go forward in their life, to have, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, these qualities corrected, to fix these problems that they have in their life. This is an example, Genesis chapter number 31, verse number 25, uh, where 
uh, Laban is with Jacob. Look at verse number 25. It says, this, Then Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mount, and Laban with his brethren pitched in the mount of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, What hast thou done that thou hast stolen away unawares to me, and carried away my daughters as captives taken with the sword? Wherefore didst thou flee away secretly... <clears throat> Uh, flee away secretly and steal away from me, and didst not tell me that I might have sent thee away with mirth and with songs, with tabard and with harp, and hast not suffered me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Thou hast now done foolishly in so doing. It is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. But the God of your father spake unto me yesternight, saying, Take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. And now... Though thou wouldest needs be gone, because thou sore longest after thy father's house, yet wherefore hast thou stolen my goods? And Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid. For I said, Peradventure thou wouldest take by force thy daughters from me. With whomsoever thou findest thy goods, let him not live. Before our brethren, discern thou what is thine with me, and take it to thee. For Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen them. And Laban went into Jacob's tent, and into Leah's tent, and into the two maidservants' tents, but he found them not. Then went he out of Leah's tent, and entered into Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the images, and put them in the camel's furniture, and sat upon them. And Laban searched all the tent, but found them not. And she said to her father, Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise up before thee, for the custom of women is upon me. And he searched, but found not the images. And jo Jacob was wroth. So this is the point where Jacob is angry, it comes to a head, and it needs to be addressed. It says this, And Jacob was wroth, and chode with Laban. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass and what is my sin that thou hast so hotly pursued me? Whereas thou hast searched all my stuff, what hast thou found of all thy household stuff? Set it here before my brethren and thy brethren, that they may judge betwixt us both. This twenty years have I been with thee. Thy ewes and thy she-goats have not cast their young, and the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. That which was torn of beasts I brought not unto thee. I bear the loss of it. I want you to notice that. He said, I bear the loss of it. Of my hand didst thou require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was in the day the drought consumed me, and the frost by night. And my sleep departed from mine eyes. Thus have I been twenty years in thy house, I serve thee fourteen years for thy two daughters and six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wages ten times. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely thou hast sent me away now empty. God hath seen mine affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked thee yesternight. So you can see there Jacob also mentioning all of the affliction that came from the hand of Laban upon him. And it, when you look at the relationship that Laban and Jacob had while he was still dwelling in the land of Syria, in Padanaram, what was it? Was there a lot of problems occurring all the time? There's nothing mentioned, is there? You know, what happened? He says that he suffered the loss of it. So for a long time, Laban was doing Jacob wrong. Laban was hurting Jacob, harming Jacob, taking things from Jacob, not treating Jacob well. But do you know what Jacob did during that period of time? It says that Jacob suffered the loss. He said, I took the loss of it. He suffered the loss of it. And what was the reason? What's the purpose? What's the reason why? Why would someone suffer the loss in those types of situations? Why should we suffer the loss? Because peace should be important to us. Because having peace, in this case, with his father-in-law, in this case, with his father, in this case, with family, was important. You know, there's all different types of situations where this can, can occur. It doesn't have to be parents or, or father-in-law, mother-in-law, sister-in-law, right? It doesn't matter. It can be family. It can be brothers. It can be brothers in Christ. You see the same situation with Jacob and Esau. Right? Where there's, a, there's a, 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 an issue and it kind of you know, uh, is, is resolved with peace there. But what was the reason why that, that Jacob suffered the loss? It was because he wanted to keep peace. He wanted to be a peacemaker. 
in your life, you're going to have a lot of different relationships. And people are going to do you wrong constantly. All the time. They're going to do bad things to you. They're going to hurt you, whether it be you know, uh, friends, family, Christian, brothers and sisters. Whether it, it, it doesn't matter. People at work, they're going to do you wrong all the time. You as a Christian, your priority should be being a peacemaker. You should be seeking peace in your life. You should be looking for ways to bring about peace. And if you wanted to pay back every single person that did something wrong to you, you'd be living a life of misery and a life of hostility. A life of evil, like the Bible says. We should be looking for and seeking peace. And you know what you need to do in order to have peace? And when a person that desires peace, you need to be willing to suffer loss. Now, are there times when it needs to come to a head? Maybe a person has done you wrong so badly where it needs to be addressed? Yes. There is a point for that. But notice how, how much. This is, a, this is the epitome of a person that is attempting to be a peacemaker. The life of Jacob with Laban. Notice how much wrong Laban did to him first. You know what he did? He suffered it for a long, long period of time. He put up with it. Why? To keep the peace. Now, was there a time where it needed to be addressed? Yes. And that's one thing that I want you to leave with is that's the minority. That is the anomaly. Most of the time it's petty. Most of the time it's small. Most of the time things that, that you are able to suffer loss. Things you're able to look over. Things you're able to, you know, just ignore and avoid. Now, this situation ends with this. This is the last thing that I want to say. This situation, and I don't know if you've ever noticed this, and I don't think I pointed it out when we went through it, but this situation with Laban and Jacob ends with peace, doesn't it? There's a peace offering, there's, there's food, right? It ends with peace. But do you know how it ends with peace? It ends with peace in, in Jacob and Laban setting a landmark up and saying what? I'm not going to go on that side and you're not going to come on this side. Do you know what that means? We're not going to have anything to do with each other anymore. You're not coming to me and I'm not coming to you. They're saying, they're saying that we're just not going to see each other anymore. Laban's promising to not come to Jacob. Jacob's promising to not go to Laban. Sometimes, this is the last point, in order to have peace... You just got to cut a person off. You just got to not be around them anymore. You just got to, you know, if, if a person is, a neighbor is just so dysfunctional, you know what you need to do? Avoid them. Stay away from them. You should try to end it with peace. But you need to resolve the situation of, hey, here's the thing. If a person is constantly bringing peace and there's just a, or, or I'm sorry, hostility or problems and fightings, conflicts every time they get around you, and you've tried to resolve it and you can't, you need to just not be around the person. If you're seeking peace, you know what you need to do? Get that person out of the way. If you're not able to have peace because of this person, then you need to move that person out of the way. If there's a person at work that's constantly fighting and arguing with you, you know what you need to do? You need to not be around that person. You need to stay away from that person. If there's you know, uh, uh, a brother, sister, a family member, whatever it is, and they're just completely just dysfunctional, they're constantly causing conflict. They're constantly fighting with you. You know, maybe it's a, an unsaved family member. This happens often, right? You'll have an unsaved family member that's just, just constantly, you know, a, a problem, an issue in your life. And you're just, you, you, you know, every time you get around them, you know, it's, there's, there's no peace. You know what you need to do? You need to make a peace offering, you need to you know, set up the landmark, and you need to you know, uh, uh, establish the, the, the fact that we're just not going to be around each other anymore. You know, I, this is an example. I was actually writing this sermon on my way back. I let my wife drive for like three or four hours on the way, on the way back to Jacksonville. I was writing this sermon. I had, I had a person write me when I went to uh, Cincinnati to, hang out, or to, uh, to, to uh, be in Thanksgiving, and he wrote me. Like, hey man, you know, we should, we should hang out when you're here. Somebody I, who I hung out with, you know, when I was a rebel rouser. You know, and I got in trouble and things like that. And I wrote the guy back. You know, he wrote me once. He's like, hey, you and, you know, this guy, we should get together and hang out. He wrote me again afterwards, you know, kind of like offended. Like really badly. You know, wasn't he? Really badly. 
Just like, you know, that I didn't write him back. He saw that I read it and I didn't write him back. Well, on my way back, I wrote him back. And I told him, I said, hey, I just wanted to respond to your earlier message. And I explained to him, I said, hey, I want, I want you to understand, I'm not the same person. I don't talk the same. I don't walk the same. I don't speak the same. I said, I'm not interested in the same things. I said, you know, I, he you, you know, used some language that I wouldn't have used in his, in his, in his uh, post. I said, hey, I don't use, and I put in quotation, cuss words. You know, he used a particular word that I wouldn't use. I said, I don't use cuss words. I don't watch Hollywood movies. I said, I don't listen to the same music. I said, hey, Seth, this has nothing to do with you personally. I have nothing against you specifically as a person. I said, but I'm not the same person. And I said, if I hung out with you and you hung out with me, neither one of us would want to continue hanging out with each other after a period of time. I had no re You know what I could have done when I wrote him? You know, I don't want to be around your filthy lifestyle. You know, you live this wicked life and you do all this and you do all that. Is that going to help anything? You think that that's going to help him? You think that's the situation where it's my responsibility to try to rebuke somebody and correct them? I just explained to the guy like, hey, you know, we're not the same. And I told him, I said, hey man, to be honest, I'm not, you know, I'm not interested in hanging out with you and I guarantee that if you hung out with me, you wouldn't be interested in hanging out with me either. We're not the same. And I said, hey, nothing against you specifically as a person, but our lifestyles are way different. There was, you, know, you know what I was doing? And he responded back and he said this. He said, okay man, I understand. His first message before that, when I didn't respond back, was pretty heated, you know. But, you know what I did was, I understood, and I told him, I said, hey, I'd love to say hi to you and see you maybe when we were out. Just say, hey, how have you been? You know what I did? I set up that landmark, and I understood, hey, we're not going to be able to be friends ever again. Unless, you know, he gets saved and things like that, and I'm going to, you know, send him a Bible Way to Heaven video. I plan on doing that. But I'm not going to be friends with that person unless he got saved and started living a Christian life. I'm not going to. I'm not going to yoke up with this person. You know, Esau, I believe, was saved. But even Esau living a sinful life, Jacob didn't want to be with him. He never went to see her. He gave him excuses. Two excuses. Yeah, what need of it? Right? He had dis dis discretion, discernment. Right? He, he had to put away his pride. He had to be a humble person. Because why? Because he desires peace. I have no reason to, to write back and forth with that guy in hostility and argue with him about his lifestyle. I just explained to him, hey, this just wouldn't work out, man. In your life, you're going to have a lot of different relationships, a lot of different types of people, a lot of different types of interactions. And the dynamics are going to be different in all of those situations. It is a skill to be a peacemaker. You need to develop the skill. Number one, you need to be a humble person. Number two, you need to have discretion with your tongue. You need to be able to speak to people and to bring about peace. And you need to choose out your words wisely. You can either destroy a relationship forever in a, in a sensitive situation or you can repair it and fix it. And number three, the very last point here is you need to be able and you need to be brave enough to address the situation and to address the issue when it comes to a head. You need to know when that needs to take place. You need to, be, you need to have enough courage to address the situation. And furthermore, again, uh, it needs to be repeated, you need to have enough uh, discretion and discernment with how to address the situation. We should be peacemakers. We should not be confrontational people. We should not be known as being confrontational, being contentious. David, King David, said, I am for peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Our disposition should be that of peace. We should be peacemakers. We should be trying to bring about peace in every situation possible. We shouldn't just be maintaining a relationship where there's a problem. If, it's, if peace is not possible, the person you need to set up the landmark. You need to put the person aside and say, hey, we're just not going to be able to be around each other. We're just not going to be able to continue with this relationship. We need to make sure at all costs that Peace has priority. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you, dear God, for having the perfect balance of, of good and, and, uh, and the positive and the negative. Dear Lord, and knowing when there needs to be peace, knowing when there needs to be war, dear God, help us to, uh, to have discernment in this area. 
Help us to have discretion with our tongue, dear Lord. Help us to, uh, to uh, be able to uh, develop these skills and to be able to get along with everyone in all walks and all areas of our life. And, and uh, we thank you for everyone that showed up in the services today, dear God, all the families that are here. We ask you that you would bless Brother Russell and, and uh, Mrs. Bobs on, on their drive back and keep them safe, give them safe passage. We love you so much. Bless the rest of the day. Help there be many people uh, saved, the souls out saved, dear God. And uh, uh, be with our services tonight. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.